Okay, um, so you are here to uh, hear the papers, not to hear me. I'm Josh Whitford, co-director of the Idea Lab on firms and industrial policy, but what I'm doing right now is introducing someone else. Um, so Gordon Hansen has a paper with Danny Roderick entitled, entitled How Do Place-Based Policies, place Policies Work? It's got a half an hour. We're playing economist rules for you who are economists know this, uh, the rest of you, with meaning that you know, try and let him get the first five minutes out. Um, but, you know, so he kind of know where he's going, but he, you know, we want, we want dialogue. We want, we want questioning. Um, so if you have a question, I mean, try and raise your hand, and he will handle his own questions. If it gets out of hand, then I'll step in. But what I'll do, I have no idea. Um, so take it away. Great. Thanks. Um, I, re I really appreciate the invitation to present this work. Uh, this is, um, we don't have a paper yet. And so what I'm giving you is a progress report um, on a big project that Danny Roderick and I are undertaking at the Kennedy School that's also funded by the same Hewlett initiative that, that Suresh uh, mentioned earlier. Um, I also need to thank the organizers for the fact that it's not explicitly industrial policy, it's place-based policy. Uh, now the distinction between the two is fuzzy, um, but we're gonna give you a definition of place-based policy um, and it kind of echoes the, the definition that Nathan and Rekha have used in, in their work. And so it is different, but uh, place-based policy often ends up with an implicit sector bias, even if not um, an explicit one. Um, okay, so uh, like industrial policy, place-based policy uh, is kind of back. Um, and the overlap with industrial policy is substantial, but industrial policy is a lot sexier. It's a lot sexier because it's at the technology frontier and it's happening in superstar cities and it's new and it's exciting and it's where human prosperity will be uh, founded going forward. Uh, Place-based policy is about the other tale of the spatial distribution. It's about the places that might have been at the frontier 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and then woke up one morning and said, the world has changed. How do we then position to do the new thing and are having a hard time uh, doing so? Um, so the, uh, I will be, um, I'll give you our definition in a little bit. Um, I, we're thinking about place-based policy as, as interventions that target places that are stuck with low wages uh, and low uh, employment rates. The tools that we're talking about, a lot of them are kind of what industrial policy does. You're promoting investment, you're promoting skill acquisition, uh, you're promoting land redevelopment. But a lot of this is not so much about getting to the new thing. It's helping factors that are trapped doing an old thing that doesn't work very well to reposition to do uh, uh, something new. Um, the aims here um, are multiple. Uh, the, the thing that kind of that, uh, that resonates uh, across uh, different interventions is the idea that we're talking about places that used to have good jobs and they don't have good jobs anymore, and we'd like to create good jobs again. And so that means kind of upgrading economic structures, uh, and it means finding ways to raise uh, uh, productivity. The industrial policy is very much in the news. Place-based policy is kind of under the radar. Uh, uh, economists and academics in general were a lot more involved in place-based policy 25 years ago. There were uh, master's programs all over the place that would talk about this stuff. Today, the academy has kind of abandoned the domain is just coming back in. The people doing the work in this area didn't stop doing the work. There is an entire industry of local economic developers who have their own associations, who have their own networks, and who have their own concept of, of policy practice. Uh, and part of what we're doing is just kind of rediscovering this world. So with the typical arrogance of economists, we assume it doesn't exist if we don't know about it, and then we discover it, and we say, we discovered the world of place-based policy. No, they've been doing this all along. And so we're trying to, un we're, what Danny and I are trying to do is kind of get inside the conceptual model that folks have in their heads about uh, what they're doing and, and where do those models uh, come from. Yeah. Well, well, I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, okay, so simple motivation for this. I'm uh, sorry, the colors don't come across uh, as well as I'd like. Um, the, uh, uh, on the left, uh, you're looking at the fraction of prime age males, 25 to 54, without a BA degree, um, who were jobless in 1990. And so red is bad. Red are pl places with high joblessness. 30 years later, what do you see? A lot more red. Uh, and so this looks like spatial misallocation. Um, we're not 
uh, deploying a substantial fraction of our labor force in a lot of different places. And think of this as a, these places that are, that are red, aggregate them up. You're talking about uh, 25 to 30 percent to the U.S. population living in these places. Um, and so it's not, it's not a trivial share of, uh, of the overall economy. And so what place-based policy is about is how do we kind of undo uh, the redness? Okay. So, quick. What's that? Um, so the thing, um, if I go back to 1990, uh, the great, great question on, on women, because today the map for women looks almost identical. Joblessness for men and joblessness for women have converged. The time series on women is complicated because female labor force participation increased substantially over time. But today, the places where joblessness is a problem for men uh, is, is a, are places where joblessness is a, a problem for women. I guess I have two questions quickly. Is it place-based policy to use the same exact tools in a high-income region? And uh, is it OK to be disemployed if you don't have to be so, Let's wait till I get to my definition, OK? Good. OK. So um, what are our options to deal with joblessness? One is kind of let market forces work. This is more or less what we're doing in most places. The place-based policy we're doing is kind of stuff on the margin. Um, now, the problem here uh, is um, what, uh, you know, the excellent recent work by uh, Pablo Pajobam and Ce uh, Cecile Gobert and Adrian Bilal show us is that kind of you can, places can get stuck in these low-wage, low-employment uh, equilibria. And what the, this work has also to told us is that policy is not irrelevant. Um, our old understanding of agglomeration is that forces of agglomeration are common everywhere. So if I try and create a cluster here, I'm just going to undo a cluster there. I'm not changing the spatial distribution of economic activity. What the new work shows us is in this world with compensating differentials that interact with spillovers, uh, there is a constructive role for policy in theory. Now the question is, how close do we get to that? Part of the goal for our policy, uh, for our, this project, is telling us, well, what are the resource flows doing? Are they doing anything like theory might suggest? And we don't need to get super precise on this. We're going to have some very simple first order tests that I'll show you uh, in just a bit. Uh, second approach, don't treat uh, places, treat people. So this is Dixit concept of targeting and this kind of dominated economic thinking and why do we want to, um, and, and why we didn't take um, uh, place-based policy uh, seriously. The problem here is that the existing policies we have, social safety net pro uh, uh, programs, they still don't really work. Uh, they're, not, they're, not, they're, they're delivering small amounts of resources and not for very long, and they aren't really helping regions transition. And what we've learned from a lot of different pieces of research, a lot of it coming out of Opportunity Insights, is that there's such a thing as place effects. When you move people to a bad place, their life outcomes deteriorate. When you take people out of a bad place, their life uh, outcomes improve. And that's not just true for kids. The recent Card, Rothstein, and, and Yee work shows that it's true for workers, too. Um, so um, uh, the, and the place effects are then all the more important because of challenges with mobility. Now, mobility is not an issue for young workers with a BA degree. They're pretty mobile in response to economic shocks. It's an enormous, there's essentially no mobility for people over 40 without a BA degree. And then there's some amounts of mobility for younger folks uh, who, are, uh, who are less educated. Uh, so the, ch the, the existence of labor immobility is a real challenge here. Now, the question is, what would it take to get people to move? We've done experiments of this in developing countries. We haven't done experiments in high-income countries. Um, but the economic gains to mobility, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going to come back to this in a little bit. So I just wanted to highlight that there. So, OK, well, the other stuff's not working, so now let's, let's think about place-based policy. There are a lot of pitfalls here that we know very well. Uh, one is that big firms can just come in and subvert the entire process. Uh, second is that policies just might end up being capitalized into land values. Um, and then, you know, policymakers are going are gonna to make mistakes. Um, best example of part three, my colleague Ed Glazer, 2008, Brookings paper, place-based policy. Um, don't go there. 2016, Brookings paper, we might want to think about place-based policy. So um, uh, even Ed Glazer is kind of reconsidering things here. 
Okay, so what are we going to doing in this uh, uh, project? I'm really happy that Chuck Sable is here. Uh, Chuck is one of our uh, uh, intellectual godparents um, uh, on this work. Um, and it's something that is strongly multidisciplinary. Some of that work Danny and I are doing with folks in other disciplines, and some of that work we're just trying to uh, enable. So first thing we're trying to do is just kind of map out the policy production chain. How is policy created, and then how is policy delivered? Um, the funding part uh, it is not at all like I thought. Um, the recipients, this we kind of know, but there's this intermediary layer that's incredibly important for how flows go from state and federal governments uh, to, to folks on the ground. And understanding who those intermediaries are and where they come from is an important part of what we're doing. Um, then we want to say, well, okay, we have this apparatus in there. What does the apparatus deliver? And we then want to look at how, uh, what, are, what, what conditions are different policy flows targeting. And I'm going to show you this for four policy domains today. Uh, first order, what do we want funds to be doing? Well, if it's place-based policy and it's about regions in distress, funding should be going to regions in distress. And so we're going to use a very simple test and look at what's happening in these different domains. And then because these intermediaries are really important, and I'll give you examples of what these things are in just a second, um, understanding where, what the determinants of their capacity is important, but first we've got to measure that capacity. And I probably won't have be able to say how we're doing this. The two-second version is every policy resource flow leaves some data residue about the agencies that are involved. And that allows us to track who's showing up. But then we're doing a much bigger thing that's going out and uh, making use of the, the industry associations that, that folks belong to. Um, the International Economic Development Council is a big one. 5,000 members, everyone who's an economic developer belongs. Okay, what is place-based policy? Here's our definition. So it's narrow. Um, so it's policies that want to kind of promote factor accumulation um, uh, in regions that are economically distressed. Uh, and so this is what, you go to Fahobama and Gobert, that's what uh, the optimal place-based policy looks like. You want to be redirecting capital to low-wage places. And so our, uh, uh, that we're going to take that, that's the definition of what place-based policy is trying to do. Um, now, there are a bunch of other policies that might be place-based incidentally, if not intentionally. Uh, social safety net, because poor people will concentrate in particular places. Income taxes, because brackets are nominal and low-income places are going to be in lower tax brackets. And then anything that's infrastructure, highways, military bases, ho hospitals, prisons. We're going to be measuring as much of this as we can. We're not going to do the income tax piece, but for all the other stuff, so that we then say, how place-based is place-based policy relative to social safety net, prisons, military bases, and so forth. I won't have that part to show you today because that's in uh, process. Okay, so then think then at just in terms of the analytics as we think about, now we're not, nothing I'm gonna say is normative today about what we should be doing. It's positive in trying to understand um, what are, the, uh, what are the, the mechanisms through which policy is delivered and what can we say about the objectives of folks involved. So st start at the highest level, you know, any, any model is going to have a social planner who's trying to address uh, certain uh, uh, distortions. Now, how does it work in practice? How it works in practice is we get major pieces of legislation that are going to try and do a thing. Small business administration, promote uh, small business. Uh, different pieces of different uh, uh, iterations of, of, of workforce development legislation, which subsidizes worker training and funds community colleges. That creates a framework and formulas that stay in place for 15, 20, 25 years. So for the purposes of policymaking, those structures are given. Now there's annual appropriations within that structure, and those vary year by year, but they don't really vary in a targeted way. When a big national thing happens, Congress says, we got to throw a lot of money at this. Great recession happens, uh, federal government more than doubles the money it gives to community colleges for worker training. Great recession's over, money's gone. COVID, again, flooding the system. The Economic Development Administration has a $350 million uh, annual budget until build, build Back Better. It went to $3.5 billion. 
it's going to go back down to 350 million. That challenge in the appropriations is an enormous issue for the organizations that are on the ground because they have to deal with the, what they colloquially call the pig in the python funding model of the federal government. Um, okay, second level. Now, states are doing their own thing. And mostly what states are doing is, going after, is trying to attract business. Um, so this is mayors and governors going out and hunting for trophies and using tax incentives to do so. And here's the funny thing about those tax incentives. We think of this as kind of backroom deals and, and it's all kind of negotiated on a bilateral basis. Mainly not. Um, the tax breaks are statutory. They're on the books. And then what you have to figure out is, well, what, what does a given deal qualify for? And so the negotiation is there's a little bit on the discretionary side, but it's kind of figuring out kind of how do we structure, how do we figure out how, uh, how a particular company can avail itself of particular things. Um, and this is, um, uh, this is a big deal. It's not as big as you think in terms of the magnitude of the flows, and I'll show you that in just a little bit. Now, what we're kind of emphasize is this is not where place-based policy, much of place-based policy happens. It happens at the third level, with local actors who have to take the federal structure and federal funding as given, they have to take governor's trophy hunting as given, and then they have to figure out, well, how do we do things on the ground? So to do things on the ground, what they typically have to do is then create intermediary organizations that can pull funding out of the system or put themselves higher up in the list to get one of these uh, 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 trophy firms. There's a little bit of work that kind of gets into this domain um, Marianne Feldman and Nicola Lowe have a couple of really nice papers that talk about uh, these organizations, and I'm going to give you an example in, uh, in just a second. Um, and a lot of it has a flavor of the stuff that um, Danny and Chuck have done on ARPA, though in a, in a very different guise. Okay, so let me then, going back to this model of these three levels, let me give you what a lot of economists think of is canonical place-based policy. This is the Kansas City border war, which is, if you don't know it, it's awesome. Um, Kansas City is a city that lies partly in Missouri and partly in, in Kansas City. Economic developers have incentives to, for gross job creation in a given year in their jurisdiction. The Missouri jurisdiction is not Kansas City. It's the Missouri part of Kansas City. What's the easiest way to increase gross job creation in the Missouri part of Kansas City? bribe firms from the Kansas part of Kansas City to move across the state borders. Missouri started doing that. Kansas said, oh, no, you don't. In the 2010s, the two states together spent $350 million bribing companies to go back and forth. So if you, if you add, even if economists don't know about the Kansas City border war, this is the model they have in their head. Now, I want to give you a very different model, um, and not to say this is more true, just to say it's also true. So um, Grand Rapids and Rochester in the 90s faced existential threats to their economic futures. Grand Rapids produced furniture. So the China shock, stuff I've been living and breathing for a while. So uh, what were the two industries most at risk of being China shocked? Furniture and textiles. Um, uh, Rochester, home of Kodak, which made the wrong bet on digital photography. They had to figure out how then you become something new in a world that has turned against you in a significant way. A big part of how they did this was the creation of economic, an economic development organization, a public-private partnership, which then didn't have a budget. Its job was to convene, to orchestrate, to navigate, to strategize, to be the civic champion, to get people on the same page regarding where do we want to put our investments in workforce development. Um, what type of small business services can we offer and how do we fund this? Um, how do we, what, what do we need to attract people to, to come back to our towns in terms of revitalizing downtown uh, uh, and so forth? So the trophy hunting happens. It's a big deal. But so do these local intermediaries uh, happen. Um, and these are the good cases. What we're trying to figure out is are, are, are are, are these examples from Grand Rapids and Rochester, are they, at the, are they at the 80th percentile? Are they at the 90th percentile? Are they at the 95th percentile? Can't tell you that right, right yet. Cheng Jin. It sounds like a what? It's got some uh, public sector funding. 
and the organizations they're representing include a bunch of uh, public sector actors. So you're gonna have the president of the local state university. Um, you're gonna have the president of the local community colleges. You're gonna have, have the head of the Rochester Economic Development Authority. So the private sector is here, and in each case, uh, philanthropy uh, played a significant role, but you can go to other contexts where the actor is actually coming from a public sector institution. In smaller places, the civic champions um, are oftentimes presidents of the local community college. Uh, so these intermediaries come in different flavors. And we're trying to, you know, we, right now we have a bunch of examples and we're trying to uh, figure this out. This is kind of the, what we've done the least uh, on. Um, so this is kind of what we then, you know, if we want to say something about place-based policy, we need to detect these uh, intermediary organizations and we need to know what they do. Um, we need to say something about how good they are. And then once we've done all of that, we can say, it doesn't matter. Um, do, do when you have higher state capacity, do you actually deliver something that looks like better policy and is it uh, effective? Okay, but what I wanna do in just kind of the remaining uh, few minutes um, is um, now just, let's go back to part two of our exercise, which is uh, tracking place-based policy funding to try and say, well, what, what is it, where is it going? What is it targeting? And in so doing, I will help you, I will chart out the different, the four main policy domains that we're calling place-based policy and identifying some of the actors involved. Question. Um, I, well, I would lo uh, g love to get the reference in the break. Um, uh, it may be that some of our RAs have actually prepared a Greenville case. We, we're, have lot, we're, we're producing lots and lots of cases uh, uh, on stuff. Um, okay, so as a benchmark, I'm just kind of going to take the social safety net. Um, and so th and this, is, this includes income maintenance programs. So this is food stamps. This is earned income tax credit. It's just kind of cash welfare. It's also Medicaid, uh, Social Security disability insurance, um, and the like. Um, where do these government transfers go? On the left-hand side in every graph I'm going to show you, it's going to be benefits per capita. Okay? And then on the right, uh, on the, uh, the uh, x-axis, what we're going to have is the employment to population ratio for prime age men without uh, a, a bachelor's degree. Uh, we're using men here because if over time, this is kind of the simplest metric of labor market uh, distress. Um, I, if we're gonna use the, uh, for this year, I could use women here and I would get a very uh, similar result. But I don't wanna use the total employment rate because there's no action on the college educated side. So I wanna say, uh, we're thinking about the bottom 65% of workers um, and places where their um, employment rates are low. So what does, this is a bin scatter uh, across um, commuting zones, and this is the um, employment rate, the employment to population ratio around 2010 at the end of the Great Recession. So Great Recession has done its damage caused massive increases in unemployment in a bunch of places. Danny Yagan's work has shown the places that saw big increases in unemployment, it stuck around, okay? Now, um, so what about social safety net? It's going to places with low employment rates because those places have low income and people with low incomes qualify for these programs. This is a bin scatter across 722 commuting zones. So each dot represents 5% of uh, a 5% bin. Um, of commuting size, okay? So now we're just gonna redo this for four different policy domains. So let's start with business recruitment. Uh, now what is business recruitment? It, uh, the Good Jobs First um, uh, organization has tracked these subsidies. This is the same data source that Kaylin Slattery uses in her work. She focuses on the, the mega deals. We're looking at everything. Um, so the, uh, these, um, these subsidies come in two forms. One comes from state governments that are primarily tax breaks, tax abatements, tax credits, uh, and, the so forth, and so forth. You see in blue here, those, those average kind of around $30 billion a year, okay? So keep that figure uh, in, in, in your head. Now the federal government does a bunch of stuff regarding investment on the side. They aren't providing tax breaks. What they're primarily doing is providing loan guarantees. 
So this is Export Im Import Bank. This is Department of Energy. This is uh, the Small Business Administration. Those tend to be high during periods of crisis, so coming out of the Great Recession. And then in normal times, they're small. They're around 10 billion, so about a third of what uh, state governments are doing. So first fun fact, federal government and state governments never coordinate on business attraction. Your, uh, your a deal has federal funding, a deal has state funding. They're not, they're not working together. So think of these as coming out of two very different parts of the bureaucracy. So our, now we're just going to look at the state piece here. Do subsidies to attract investment? <coughs> and we're going to look at average subsidies per capita over the 2010s plotted against your initial employment rate. Are these subsidies going to places with high joblessness? No, not at all. Um, where are they going? Um, they're going to places that are already doing pretty well. They aren't going to the, to necessarily to the, to, the, to the true winners. They're going to places that are OK, but they're not going to struggling regions. And that's not what governors are about. Governors want ribbon cuttings. How do you get ribbon cuttings? You don't do it by saying, come to, by uh, trying to convince a firm to come to a place with high joblessness. They're like, I don't want it. I don't, I don't want to be in a place with high joblessness. Um, uh, so uh, this is, I can show you this 10 different ways, and it's very, very uh, hard. And the other work, uh, uh, Kalen's work has, finds a similar thing. The big, the big trophy deals don't go to hurting places. Okay, uh, so this is one domain. Domain two, now we're not mega deals, we're thinking about small business development. This happens primarily through the Small Business Administration, and, that, and, and their programs take two types. One are loan guarantees, and the loan guarantees can either be for working capital, debt retirement, or whatever. Those are pretty easy to get, and they have to go through an approved lender. So to get a small, those sorts of small business lending, you have to have approved lenders in your place. That's a hurdle. Now, they also provide loan guarantees for long-term capital investment. That's the really valuable stuff. To get that, you have to have a certified development corporation nearby. That's a higher hurdle. So we already have kind of one form of state capacity that's going to be important. Can you form this type of, uh, of entity? The other thing that the Small Business Administration does is fund small business development centers, which do the sort of RC, uh, that which conduct the sort of management training that we've analyzed via RCTs in developing countries and found that they really work. Small Business Administration has been doing this for 30 years, and it hasn't been studied uh, in a meaningful way. Everyone we've talked to says they're great. Um, they, small business comes and they get good management advice and they get it quite cheaply. Now, um, we're, I'm not going to talk about that, that advice. I'm going to say, let's talk about the loan guarantees. Um, where, uh, which places get loan guarantees? Are they places with higher joblessness? So are we promoting capital accumulation where joblessness is scarce? Because um, capital gets scarce where jobs are scarce because housing prices are depressed and people don't have the collateral to start a business. No. Small business administration loans perfectly track the market. There's a reason for this. Congress forces them to break even on an annual basis. Um, and not only that, it seems to be happening at a regional level, so you're preventing any sort of redistribution. Now, you could want the Small Business Administration to break even over some horizon, but if you're trying to reallocate capital to areas where you want to promote job creation, you got to allow for some redistribution, and it's not doing it. Um, Third, um, investing in, I, I've got two minutes left, so let me get to that and then, we, then I'll, I'll, I'll break. Um, uh, uh, it's uh, subsidies for investing in low income areas. After trophy firms, this is the other thing that folks really focus on, enterprise zone. Enterprise zones are rounding error. Um, the Obama administration empowerment zones, which were defined in 184 communities, over 10 years gave out $1.4 billion, irrelevant. Now, there's a piece that's not irrelevant, and these are subsidies that are given out through these financial institutions called community development financial institutions and a subvariant class of them, community development entities. You have to have the wherewithal to create one of these things in order to get access to the tax breaks. Guess what? Only bigger, richer places are able to create these entities. They serve low-income areas, but they serve low-income areas in richer cities, and so when you look at the, um, the tax credits that they give out per capita, are they going to places with high joblessness? 
No, they're not. Um, and that in part be, uh, because of this hurdle that's built in. Okay, finally some good news, okay? Fourth domain. So we, we're talking about incentivizing big capital, incentivizing small capital, redeveloping land. Then now we have to talk about labor. Um, the labor is not about subsidized worker training through uh, the vouchers that the federal government provides because it's also rounding error. $1.4 billion a year to dislocated workers. Where the real training happens is in community colleges which have certificate programs targeted to specific occupations. It's 40% of the degrees that community colleges give out are through these certificate programs. And the money here, state governments are spending $35 billion a year on community colleges. Federal governments are spending $10 billion uh, a year. Um, tuition only covers about 15% of expenditure. So these are heavily subsidized. Uh, these certificate programs target good jobs. And there's increased enrollment in these programs in when un local unemployment uh, goes up. So what do we see? We see more public spending in areas with high joblessness. In work I'm doing with Harry Holzer, we're trying to estimate, in effect, the slope of the supply curve for career and technical education by community college. You want that to be pretty close to flat, kind of on the uh, relevant margins, because when unemployment goes up, you want people to be able to, to uh, on average, it's not flat. Um, on average, it looks almost vertical. But at the 75th percentile, these, there are programs that are, that are quite responsive. Um, so what were then, what the, summing all of this up, um, state governments uh, have this kind of default of saying, let's go after uh, trophy firms. The federal government, de by decentralizing stuff, and uh, then puts a heavy onus on the local capacity of places to make place-based policy work. They create high hurdles in terms of the organizational requirements you need to hit in order to, to get that funding. And then what's happening at the local level is all sorts of policy experimentation, which we're trying to learn about. We can find examples of really effective economic development organizations that are happening at the local level, uh, but we don't at all want to, but we know that on the average place, the median place, uh, this is not happening. And so what we're trying to figure out is, um, does this experimentation, is it responsive to local need? What are the, what are the, the, the features of places that allow that uh, experimentation uh, to happen? So you're, you're, you're out here wanting to get us, uh, like, our, how, how close are we to optimality? Policy is here. Uh, policy is pro-cyclical. Uh, policy is biased in favor of bigger, richer places that happen to have some poor neighborhoods. So given we're spending the money um, in that second best world, we could be doing things a whole lot better um, before we try and get to the issue of what would optimal policy actually look like. We are um, going to have to talk to him because we are we're a, we have 25 minutes now for Chase. So uh, thanks for your question. Uh, <laughs> I'll be fast. So okay.